This is video two of seven in this series on antiarrhythmics, and the specific topic is class one antiarrhythmics, the sodium channel blockers. As mentioned in the introduction, sodium channel blockers are subdivided into three subclasses, 1A, 1B, and 1C, based upon the strength of their sodium channel blockade. However, these classes have other distinguishing characteristics, which I'll go through one at a time. First, starting with the 1A drugs, they have moderate effect at blocking sodium channels, but they also have moderate effect at blocking potassium channels as well. Because of the potassium channel blocking properties, 1A drugs increase the action potential duration and thus increase the effective refractory period. The effective refractory period is the period of time after an action potential has been triggered when the cell has not yet recovered enough for another incoming action potential to depolarize it again. If we look at the shape of the fast response action potential in the presence of a 1A drug, we see that the sodium mediated upstroke is less steep and the repolarization is modestly delayed. Examples of 1A drugs include quinidine and procanamide. Quinidine was one of the first antiarrhythmic drugs used specifically for its antiarrhythmic properties. Interestingly, quinidine is a stereoisomer of quinine both of which are derived from the bark of the cinchona tree of South America and are used for malaria. Quinine was first prescribed for atrial fibrillation by Carl Frederick Wenkebach of type 1 second degree AV block fame, and it was a different cardiologist who later observed that quinidine seemed to be more effective for arrhythmias. However, quinidine is still not particularly effective, and it's poorly tolerated and thus rarely used today. Moving on to the 1B drugs, these have relatively weak effect at blocking sodium channels, but their effect is most prominent in already depolarized tissues that can be seen in ischemia. So these drugs can be helpful at treating arrhythmias in the setting of angina or acute MIs. When it comes to the action potential duration and effectory refractory period, 1B drugs decrease them slightly. So the action potential looks like this with a very slightly decreased slope to the upstroke and mild shortening of the action potential. There is not a conclusive explanation for the observed decrease in the refractory period and the shortened action potential. While there are a few informal web resources that make claims about a potential mechanism, these claims are not backed up by the primary literature as far as I can tell. Regardless, this shortening of the action potential does not appear to be a clinically significant effect of 1B drugs. Examples of 1B drugs include lidocaine and mixilatine. Of course, you may already be familiar with lidocaine as a topical or subcutaneous anesthetic. Its use as an antiarrhythmic, however, requires IV administration. The anti-seizure medication phenytoin, marketed in the US as Dilantin, shares its general pharmacological mechanism with class 1B antiarrhythmics, and it is occasionally listed among them. However, I've never encountered a patient on phenytoin for this purpose. And last are the 1C drugs. As you might guess, these are relatively strong blockers of sodium channels. One of the two major 1C drugs, propafenone, also has some beta blocking effect as well. Neither of the 1Cs affect the action potential duration or refractory period. So the action potential of a patient on a 1C drug looks like this, a markedly slowed upstroke, but otherwise normal. The two major 1C drugs are flecainide and the aforementioned propafenone. Now let's talk about indications, starting back with the 1As. As I mentioned before, quinidine is very rarely used these days, at least in the US. When it is used, it is as a last ditch effort for suppression of VT. Procanamide isn't particularly common either, but it is used for both rate and rhythm control in something called pre-excited AFib. This is when a patient with Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome develops atrial fibrillation. While most patients with AFib are rate controlled with beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, those drugs only have a significant impact on the slow response action potential of the sinus and AV nodes. Thus, if a patient has an accessory conducting pathway that bypasses the AV node, which is the defining feature of Wolf-Parkinson-White, 
Those AV nodal blocking drugs don't help, and there is belief that they are actually very dangerous in pre-excited AFib. Procanamide, on the other hand, slows down conduction in the accessory pathway. Other indications for procanamide include the pharmacologic cardioversion of AFib in patients without WPW, cardioversion from ventricular tachycardia, and the termination of a rhythm called AVRT, which stands for AV reentrant tachycardia, which is a reentrant supraventricular tachycardia seen specifically in patients with WPW. The 1B agents of lidocaine and mixilatine are used solely as second or even third line agents for the prevention of VT. And flecainide and propafenone are used for outpatient cardioversion of AFib. Some patients with symptomatic paroxysmal AFib will be prescribed these drugs to use on an as-needed basis. They carry the drug around in their pocket, and if they feel themselves jump from sinus into AFib, they pop one of these on their own, which can lead to the conversion back to sinus within an hour or two. This treatment strategy has been nicknamed the pill-in-the-pocket approach. Conventionally, patients who use the pill-in-the-pocket approach also take an AV nodal blocking drug, such as metoprolol or diltiazem, in the event the AFib they feel is actually atrial flutter. The danger of treating atrial flutter with class 1 antiarrhythmics alone will be covered in the common pitfall section of the last video in the series. Other indications for 1C drugs include chronic maintenance of sinus rhythm in patients with paroxysmal AFib or A-flutter. In this case, the patients would take the drug every day and not on a just-as-needed basis. And last, 1Cs can help prevent AVRT. I've covered classification and pharmacological effects as well as indications, and now I'll close with side effects and toxicity. Class 1 antiarrhythmics have class-specific side effects and drug-specific side effects. Starting with uh, quinidine and procanamide, on account of their potassium channel blocking activity, they both prolong the QT interval. And they are both negative inotropes, which means they make the heart contract less vigorously. I mentioned that quinidine is rarely used anymore, partially because it is poorly tolerated. It has many side effects, the most notable of which are diarrhea, which is really common. Quinidine, as well as quinine, also causes an interesting syndrome called synchronism, which consists of blurred vision, tinnitus, hearing loss, diaphoresis, confusion, and psychotic symptoms. Not a good thing to get. Procanamide is associated with the development of a lupus-like syndrome. Moving to the 1Bs, there's no notable class-specific side effects, but lidocaine has much CNS toxicity. Pretty much anything bad that can happen to your nervous system can be seen with lidocaine. Mixilatine's most common side effects are related to GI distress, such as nausea and vomiting. While neither flecainide nor propafenone have drug-specific side effects, they both have a very notable problem with increasing the risk of sudden cardiac death when used in patients with coronary artery disease. Thus, the presence of CAD is considered to be an absolute contraindication. They are also avoided in patients with heart failure. Another way to put that, 1C drugs are only used in patients with structurally normal hearts, that is, hearts that look normal from a macroscopic perspective. 1C drugs also cause conduction block in the sinus and AV nodes, leading to sinus bradycardia and AV block. And like the 1As, 1Cs are also negative inotropes. That does it for these sodium channel blockers. The next video will cover the class 2 drugs, beta blockers.